Okay, we are now joined by our 2021 NASCAR Xfinity Series champion, Daniel Hemrick. I know we got a bunch of questions, so we'll get right to them. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll get you a mic, and we'll start in the back, and we can make our way up with Daniel. Daniel McFadden, FrenchRush.com. I got two questions, Daniel. Um, first, uh, can you tell us about this dream you, you had a couple of months ago? Uh, because I think last night you told me that you've been waiting – your whole life for this moment you you knew like this was going to be the moment why what was the dream i mean you never know it's going to be that moment right but i don't know there was throughout my entire career i've had situations where you know your competitiveness competitiveness is at the top um you're putting your entire life into trying to figure out that particular week at the racetrack you know, I'm talking more so short track racing and particular big weekends, championship weekends, crown jewel events. Thank you. I remember always, for whatever reason, would have these certain dreams around those events. And it was so calming. I mean, to the point to where I didn't worry about what was ahead. I didn't worry about, you know, what if. And it also took me to where a spot to where it didn't let me think about what it would be like. It was just go in and put the work in. And honestly, I haven't had one of those in a really, really long time until about two months ago. And I had that, and I thought, okay, pretty calming. Show up, continue to show up, put the work in, and it'll all work out. Obviously, you can only dream that it'll work out the way it did. Um, unbelievable that it turned out the way it did. I, I could have only asked for an opportunity to line up on the front row with, you know, five to go, a green-white checker situation, and then be able to have it in like it did it's pretty mind-boggling but something that it was good to rekindle that feeling good to have those uh, dreams if you want to call them again and to be able to live those out it's pretty life-changing and for sure something I'll never forget the rest of my life the, the second question is among, among all the people that were in that the throng around your car uh, was Tim Latiga the About guy that. the guy who when you were 14 sold his own car to keep your racing career alive um, what was your interaction with him in that throng, and what did it mean to have him there? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It was so special to see him, Mr. L, as I call him, Tim Latiga. Those that don't know, yeah, he sold he sold his one of his personal muscle cars that he had built and spent a ton of money on um, to put me in a legend car because, you know, at, at you know, 14, 15 years old, I was to a point to where there was no way any of my parents and step-parents, their 9-to-5 jobs could – keep me going, you know, racing. We're only talking go-karts and bandoleros, right? Next step was a legend car, and that was never in the cards. And Tim sold his uh, his car, bought a legend car. It was the first car owner of mine at 14 or 15 years old. And that was the first time I realized the work that really had to go in. I mean, it was all on my shoulders to go figure this out. And it took guys like Tim Ladd to go be able to share that moment with him out there on the start-finish line. Heck, he was part of my championship runs in 2017 and 2018 and falling short. So it was a bit of, um, you know, a bit of validation for him, I think, to, you know, he stuck his neck out so many times for me. You know, he's worked, you know, when I drove for him at that young age, heck, he worked for Hendrick, um, pitting Jimmy Johnson's car. So he would tell Jimmy, you know, you got to see this guy. He was kind of that dad, if you will, you know. <laughs> Everybody loves that dad who is always bragging about their kid. But he was that guy for me, you know, at, at that age. And, um it was cool to feel all that come full circle to see him there on the start finish line. You know, it's validation that he was telling people what he believed in me, and to, for me to go show people what he saw in me. You know, that's validation for myself. And thank for him um, through those years. Thank for him and his friendship with him and his wife Cheryl, who's actually an employee of mine, believe it or not, to this day. And um, yeah, it, it took a lot of folks like Tim Ladd to go and then past him to give me the opportunity to get here, so it was cool to share it with him. Zach? Zach Sterniolo, Front Stretch. Um, three cautions in those last 20 laps, um, when the first of those came out, when A.J. Allmendinger spun, um, what were the emotions like for you? Because um, it, it seemed like you had a better car on the long run than the short run. Um, what were the emotions at that point? Were you, uh, what was going through your mind? Yeah, that's very accurate. You know, I was um, very, very happy with our car after lap 20 to 25. 
all night long. And then whenever we went green there, it looked like we were going to go poss possibly, what, 60 to the end. I thought that was going to play in our hands. And that run in particular, I'd actually, you know, had more front grip and less rear grip than I had had all night, which was not going to help me, you know, keep the super living as long as I was hoping for. Um, still think I maybe could have still got to 22, but I was going to need some help. And when the caution came out and we all got to come pit again, I thought, okay, not been our strong suit. Dave Rogers asked me very directly, what do I need? So, well, it's pretty simple, Dave. I need more grip. I need more front grip, need more rear grip. I need to be able to attack harder. Um, you know, Dave has been an incredible advocate of mine to not get too far into the moment, just just live directly and, and, and tell them tell what I need, not necessarily how to do it. Um, and I think if I've ever done that, it was it was that particular pit stop. It was, I don't, I don't care what you do, just whatever it is, give me this. And when he did that, uh, whatever it was, I still haven't asked him what the adjustment was, but um, it just let me take off and, and build to at least have a chance to run with the 22. His short run speed was incredible all night. I knew we were going to have an uphill battle, um, but I also knew that the decisions I had to make in Martinsville, you know, choosing to play it safe, if you will, to give our race team an opportunity to race for tonight, I was not going to lose this championship from the second row. If I was going to lose it, it was going to be heads up to the 22 and off the front row. And I knew I could race Austin hard and aggressive and, and uh, respectfully. That's what we've, you know, that's the way we've raced each other all year. Um, you know, he's a, a hell of a race car driver. And obviously, he's got an incredible opportunity next year to keep his run with Penske going. And I know he'll make the most of it. So, you know, me not knowing, obviously, I, I know I'm going to colleague and that's all fine and good. But these folks at JGR, Dave Rogers, they believed in me so much that when I had that chance to line up on the front row, and especially after I got to fill my car through one corner on a short run, I knew we had moved the needle enough to at least give us that shot that we'd worked 33 weeks for and just knew I had to keep them in sight. If I keep them in sight, we'd have a shot, and that's the way it worked out. Davey Siegel with front stretch. So the move coming off of four to win the race and win the championship, how long had you planned that move? I assume that it was probably on that restart that you kind of put it together, and did you execute it how you wanted to? Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm sitting up here, so I'd say yes, but, you know, the, the short answer is, is there was no plan. You know, um, earlier somebody asked me what was I thinking, what was the process of all those moves, and, you know, for the one of the first times in my life in the last, probably since I've been in a NASCAR vehicle, there was no thinking. It was just reacting, um, Dave Rogers has been, and, I, and I've said it many, many times since doing the celebration out there on the front stretch, that he's been on me, I mean, just been a huge critic of mine this year of pushing me to be a better race car driver only. Not the not the Daniel Hemrick who had to work on his cars, not the guy who had to drive his truck or trailer to the racetrack, not the guy who had to worry about every part and piece of the car and, and what adjustments we're going to make and all that. Worry about reacting strictly off instinct. So there was no plan. It was go where he's not, position myself to where that run's going to be or how it's going to develop, just do whatever you can to keep that forward progress moving. And um, honestly, I got loose in underneath him. Well, I had a big run to him coming before the, caution, the next last caution came out. Um, that gave me confidence to know I could, I could at least get there. Um, when I had the next shot, you know, coming to the white, I got really loose in a three underneath him and thought I put myself in a really bad spot, and I thought that's it. I said, I've let him get too far away. For whatever reason, the I had enough lateral grip to kind of feed the throttle back to it, and it stayed underneath me enough to give me a chance. Um, that's all I wanted. I wanted a chance to get into three, and he drove in hard to you know keep me from getting to him. I could had way more balance than I'd had all night getting into three, and it was just close enough to at least get him upset to give ourselves a shot, and that's where it worked out. The backflip was planned. How good did that feel to finally be able to do that, and <laughs> how did you think you stuck the landing? How did you think I stuck to landing? Pretty damn good. Yeah. I um, Somebody says, man, you surprised us. You went off the roof instead of the door. I said, like, hell, as long as it took me to win, I should have did it off the top of the flag stand. <laughs> but, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with the roof for now. It was fun. How long has it been since you did that after a win? I know you did it on the golf course, but after a win? Yeah, it's <laughs> that's funny you ask that. So, um, I th legitimately think the last time I won a race was All-American 400 2014, 2015 maybe. Um, that was the only time I've ever driven my own race car by, you know, for myself, by myself, the whole deal. And that was, a, in the, without a doubt, the biggest win of my life because 
I didn't know what was next in life. I, I had some limited truck opportunities, but at the time I was building late models and people ripping my cars and, you know, doing that kind of thing, right? So that was huge for me to build my own car and go win in it. That was at Nashville Fairground Speedway. Um, but I've gotten that question a lot leading into the championship weekend of, man, are you, can you do it still or and whatnot? And I, I've said to everybody, Toyota has whipped me into shape this year. You know, they have an incredible training program. Um, I've busted many out in their gym throughout the years. So I was more than prepared for that moment. So it was cool to be able to live that out. Justin Albino, jski.com. Uh, Danny, you said it's good and dandy, you know, moving to Collie Racing next year. So now that you got the win, you got the championship with JGR, is there any regret of leaving JGR? Yeah, none. No, no regret. My, my goal coming here to Joe Gibbs Racing, first off, and have the opportunity provided to me by Joe from Coy, um, obviously everyone at TRD and Toyota, and, and most importantly, you know, Poppy Bank, right? I mean, you know, they made an investment in me this year. <laughs> it's funny. I, I don't know how far it's too far to go with this, but, you know, I took a ride this year. People thought about betting on themselves. I took a ride this year to not make a dime, to not get paid, to have to perform, to be able to put food on the table. When I say that, I mean you don't run within what you can see in one hand. You do not make a dime that weekend. And I knew that was – the only chance for me to rebuild my career, right? And Poppy Bank said they would support that if that's the decision I made. Um, they've had my back through, you know, thick and thin, through building to the Cup Series, to them not really having to be too involved to help me rebuild my career, right, when it's unraveling before me um, come midway through 2019, losing my ride, feel like the whole world's crumbling around you, right? This, this sport you live in, from the time you're five years old, next thing you know, you're on the decline. You've reached the peak and now you're on the decline. That's a feeling I never wanted to experience, never hope anybody else has the experience. But at the end of the day, it's business. And they stuck with me through that, gave me that shot to go to JGR, and I promised them I would do everything in my power to show them success. Did it take way longer than I wanted to? Absolutely. Um, Mr. Bill and Miss Cindy and, and Will, obviously the folks I'm talking to at Poppy Bank, you know, changed my life, changed my family's life, our course of our lives. And then put me in a situation to bet on myself to go to JGR. Um, it's obviously bittersweet, right? When, when you win one, you want to win the next one, and it's all fine and good. But I'm just thankful to be able to drive for coach, be around him, his group, his people. You know, he, he, he teaches and preaches about people. That's all he talks about. And I've had incredible people before JGR. I've had incredible people at JGR. I'm looking forward to having incredible people support me moving forward. But, you know, Betting on yourself, it's hard to it's hard to beat that, and tonight prove that. Thank you, John. The field, the racing experts. Uh, you know, just coming close on several different occasions this season and in the past. You know, what does it do for you to not have to answer that question of when am I going to win? You know, or what what are you going to win? And that's a damn good feeling. I can promise you that. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, you know. <laughs> it's funny, I, I saw uh, Del Jarrett walked up on the stage, right? And I can promise you, I was very aware that him and I were tied for, I think, 10 second place finishes. And I told him I did not, did not want to break his record. So, uh, no, I mean, listen, when you do that as many times as I have, you're, you're keeping yourself in the game, right? That means you've continued to show up, you've continued to, to be there. And everybody said, oh, man, you're so close. Um, and then next thing you know, another year goes by. And then that another year goes by. And then self-doubt creeps in, right? That's what we talk about, that process of, you know, coming through 2017, 18, 19, then this rebuild process that's taken to get here. Yeah, through that deal, man, I've had just so many people just continue to, to push me and to let me know that that's not who I was. I'm not that guy. I'm not the, the guy that's going to always run second. I'm not the guy who who's going to quit at this. And they're right. I feel like when it's been the toughest – you know, a lot, of, a lot of people don't continue to show up. They just continue to remind me to keep showing up. And um, I can promise you as I sit here, I'm thankful I did. Uh, Bob Pockris, Fox Sports. Uh, since you kind of brought, brought it up, I'll ask, when if the finishes, if you had finishes that you can count on, when, or the in the top five, I guess, from what you indicated, like are those good paydays? And is that, I mean, 
you don't seem to be a guy who's hugely motivated by money, but I mean, does that did that impact you the way you drove? No, it didn't. Definitely didn't impact the the hunger to feel this is what impacted me tonight. Um, it's impacted me my whole life. It's a matter of getting the opportunity and seizing it, right? Um, I will tell you though, from a perspective, right? Any parent will tell you that that when it's it's you and your wife, it's one thing you think you'll figure it out, and then when you bring another person in this world, like our little girl Ren, that's a different perspective. So to bet on yourself and know the livelihood of your family, your daughter eating, putting food on the table, now that changes it. And to know that the decisions I had to make last week to give our family the shot to do what we did tonight, there's no more motivation needed than that. And you said after the race that you'd take all the heartbreaks again to live this night. Yep. You never lived this night. Would all those heartbreaks not been worth it? Would, it, would you rather not have finished second? Ten times. If if it leads to moments like this, Bob, I don't know what else you do. I mean, I think it just. I, I think about appreciation, right? I mean, I appreciate every one of those moments. I think I said this during media week or after Martinsville. Every one of those moments, there was something to be learned internally, myself. There was something, right? I didn't pull it off. There was something, there's a reason why. You can call it circumstances, you can call it events, you can call it luck, you can call it whatever it is. Whatever that was, something to learn from. Um, I like to think I used every one of those, every one of those to make happen what I had to make happen on that green-white checker. You've had such a turbulent roller coaster type uh, few years, I guess. Um, I can't keep track. What was the one moment that you came closest to being like you that you wouldn't even be here at all tonight like you really had to sort of overcome a low point um i mean there's been many many turning points throughout my career right and we you say career lightly but you know start this at five years old you you know we're talking to the short track ranks but i talk about not having that next opportunity from the time i was 14 it was trying to figure it out on your own and when you do that, you have many of those moments. Um, but getting to the NASCAR level was was something that really happened very fast for me, to be honest with you. I mean, I figured I was going to – I've been fortunate to build a super late mile program and be with an incredible family that was supporting me and let me drive their cars and work on their cars and build their cars and, and kind of, you know, that was be my path, I thought. You know, obviously my wife, Kenzie, was there with me along that entire ride. You know, and, and through that process – then you do get here, and you're like, man, this is incredible, right? And you're just, you know, this is what you dream of. And you start looking at the odds of the people and the hundreds of thousands of kids who start out wanting to drive race cars for a living, and you realize that, you know, there's three of the top, you know, top three series, and you take those numbers, and you look at it, it's incredible to overcome to get there. And I think that I never once took it for granted, but in the grand scheme of things, having a chance to run for a championship very quickly in Xfinity Series in 17 and 18, I mean, it's, it's hard to appreciate that until, you know, until you go through tougher days. And near the m middle to end of 2019, when I learned that I would not be returning to what is the pinnacle of our sport and having a chance to continue to build something, yeah, that was, that was well, now what happens? You never, you, you know, you get there, you never think about what, how you're, how you're going to come, how you're going to rebuild. And then 2020 hit, which can we all agree that sucked for everybody. And, man, it, it was rough. I mean, couldn't finish races. Every, I felt like everything that I built my entire career around, people giving me chances, people giving me opportunity, I, I like to think was not tearing race cars up, you know, being there at the end, getting, you know, more or as much of the, as the car was there to let you without overstepping it. I feel like I did the exact opposite of all that last year with JRM, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. And it was compounding one mistake after another after another, and you know misfortune or whatever you want to call it just wasn't working out. That was that was incredibly tough, um, and I'll never forget. You know we talked a little bit about you know getting the opportunity and having support from Poppy Bank. You know it was a golf outing out in Bandon Dunes, Oregon. I'm sitting there with the you know with the the guy behind the scenes with Poppy Bank. We're on a driving range, and him and him and Coach Gibbs are on the phone, and he walks away, and I knew in that moment my entire course of my life was in the hands of that, whatever that conversation was. And I'm sitting here having to hit golf balls because I'm at this incredible golf resort 
I'm hitting these golf balls thinking to myself, he expects me to just stand here and, and just act like, oh, there's nothing, ha nothing big happening. He walks away for five minutes. He comes back, and he walks right by me, and he goes to the putt and green, didn't say a word. So I know he's had a conversation. My fate's been sealed, and I don't know what's going on. And him and his son pulled me aside right before we teed off there for a two-day event with their uh, entire kind of their higher-ups of their company. And he, um, you know, he tells me, listen, he said, you, said you want to bet on yourself, so you're going to draft for JGR next year. Prior to that day, I literally knew my life was at the fortune of the sponsorship, at the funding, at the entire outlook of what, how did he see this? Do you see me as a guy who struggled to the end of, is this a tipping point in 2020, or do you see me as a guy who's going to continue to show up if he gives me an opportunity? That was the moment for me, so that's what tonight really, really brought full circle. Go ahead. A couple things, or a few things. Um, your hauler. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely forgot that you mentioned any of that. What a mess. <laughs> I mean, you're racing for a championship. Your car's not here. What What are you thinking? It's probably a good thing. We didn't have all the parts and pieces to screw it up too bad in practice. Um, no, it. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I told everybody, I, you control what you can control, right? And the furthest thing out of my control is if my race hauler gets here with a race car. I, I literally, you know, this day and age, you know, at one point in my life that was important, and I had to get it there. Yet here we are just about as far away from my race shop as we can get. Trucks broke down in Texas and had an incredible group of folks, more than I can even name, that rallied together, made phone calls. I'm sure y'all know the car got picked up at 3 a.m. on the side of the road. Just the car and like a little tire dolly and a little bitty like carry toolbox, not even a toolbox. And that's what we had to work with. Luckily, our ARCA team had, you know, extra set of scales and stuff that we could use to at least get us by if the car was to show up. It rolls through the tunnel, what was it, 20 minutes before practice, 30 minutes before practice. NASCAR worked with us, and um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was it was funny because in that moment, I've heard coach talk about people, and nobody nobody really like everybody had their own team, right? Like you got the twenty team, you got a nineteen, you got the fifty four. Yet when that our hauler rolled through the garage, everyone were all in. All those folks were all in to get our car unloaded. What it took to and however many it took to get it through tech. Every one of them helped that process flow to make sure we got on the racetrack. That's what Coach talks about, right? It's people. And seeing that really, you know, those guys come together and bond, it meant to me, like, these guys are, they, they're all in. Um, I'm, I'm answering your question in a really long way, but in the grand scheme of things, it makes for a better story. Um, they made it here. So that means if we had the, as good a shot of anybody, it was cool that we capitalized on it. This whole story, the, the hauler not showing up, the car, you know, everything, and then tonight, you disbelief over everything? Right now, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. I, I, I don't know why, but for some reason, uh, I think back to winning the Legends Million, I think it was 2010, I cruised into that racetrack that night, you know, that, that, that race win put B is what I feel like my name on the map for a little bit, and pulled in there in a 95 Honda Civic, literally ran out of fuel, win the race, pumped fuel out of my Honda Civic, or I'm sorry, out of my race car into my Honda Civic to get me home because I don't have enough money to buy gas to get home, like all this stuff, right? And that was that was in disbelief that entire night. I'll never forget, laying down on steak and shake, head on the head on the table, all of our group of supporters are, are around eating, and I'm just tired. We prepared 12 cars, and we take home this $250,000 check to win a legend car race. And I was in disbelief. I haven't felt that until again until tonight like the things that have to go the way they have to go for stories to be wrote like the one we wrote tonight you know what else can you ask out of life right that's memories that you know I have a huge support of mine his name's Hoyt Demas he was like a father figure in my life and when I got my first NASCAR opportunity he said man this is incredible right we're saying we're sitting in Daytona I'm gearing to make my first truck start he says man this is this is great right this is the destination he said, I just want you to remember, the destination is all fine and good, but the journey is everything. The journey it took for us to get here th th today and this weekend is something something you can't make up. One person who wasn't here tonight was your mom. Yeah, how about that? Well, what, well first couple things. Why did she miss? I heard the story, but I want to make sure that I heard it right. I'm not sure. What did you hear? I heard about something about a horse. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, she's taken out this love of horses lately um, over the last couple of years, and that's kind of her out. You know, she works in the nursing field, so – Works crazy hours and something that she actually took up as I was already kind of off trying to figure out racing. And um, 
yeah, her, her, her horse got injured, and she was, it cost her a lot of money to get it, you know, worked on this, this week. Her leg got to get sewn up. I mean, all kinds of stuff you can't make up. And in the middle of all that, she called and was like, hey, you know, it's going to cost so much money, and you're going to be so busy out there. And I, and I offered, obviously, to, to fly him out here and take care of it. And she's like, you know what? You're going to be so busy. We're just going to hang out here, and we're just going to watch it, and we'll see you when you get back. And we're going to hate if we miss it. I said, well, either way, we can, we can party there. We can party back at home. So um, looks like we'll be partying back at home when we get there. But that's a cool thing to be doing. But your dad handed you the phone to talk or What was that conversation? Honestly, I couldn't hear because my father, does anybody else have that parent who, when they talk to you, it's always on speakerphone? Mm-hmm. He hands me a phone in the middle of thousands of people cheering on speakerphone. I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, what am I going to do with this? But I, I later got to talk to her once we were up on stage and, yeah, that was, it was a special moment. I could hear they had a, a view, little viewing party. There's people screaming in the background. You know, her and my, my stepfather, you know, it's pretty funny. So her, my stepfather, and my, my father, you know, they all collectively got me into this sport that I love. And whether they were here or not, I know, you know, they've all poured everything into this, and it was cool to be able to experience that, share it with the ones that were here. I promise you we'll share it together when we get home. Okay, we'll take two more. We'll go to Cole right here and then finish up right here. Cole Cusimano, the money stop. Congratulations, first off, Daniel. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the importance of coaches' guidance and the people at JGR and TRD. Do you feel that was the difference maker in you ultimately winning the race and the championship? I mean, yeah, people and bonding together, that's, that's what overcomes all. Um, I'll tell you that all the folks you named, you know, they've just been an incredible – you know, incredible um, support system for me to lean on, right? From the from the fitness side to making myself the best version of myself, to the mental side, to the um, race prep, making myself the best race car driver I can be. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's not something that comes to fruition tonight. That's that's a it's a built process, right? And that started from the time I, I took my gig at JGR from the season finale in last year here at Phoenix to to um, you know having just having everybody put the work in and be willing to, to work with me. Um, if they don't agree to be all in, none of this works. And heck, I, I know that many people on my race team in particular have no idea what they're doing next year. And the funny part is, is nobody's talked about it. I say nobody within, internally, because all they've worried about is this one moment, was building a race car over the last month and a half, not knowing their futures. And they obviously know my path. They know where I'm going next year. Yet they chose to be all in and be selfless to make sure they gave me everything they had for a couple more weeks to make sure that we could try to accomplish something that, you know, when you all check that box, it's what you check the box for is to show up and give it all you have. And they've done that, and I'm in, in ter- I mean, just incredibly grateful. We'll always be grateful in, in their debt for what they've provided me from the top to the bottom at JGR to Toyota to just, you know, everyone that's that's had my back, man. It's, it's, it's fun to be able to just – Validate, here's why you do it. Cameron Richardson, the Richard Ford, Daniel, I simply want to know who or what is your why? You know, after all the struggles with uh, in Cup Series two years ago, and then you had some really bad luck part time last year in the Xfinity Series, what kept you going to even get to this night? It's a great question. Um, I, I don't really <laughs> – I mean, for me, um, what else was there? Right? I guess that's the why. What else was I going to do? Well, I'm not going to make a living doing anything else. I'm not going to be happy doing anything else. What I've done since I was five years old, I don't know how to do anything else. I, d- I don't have a high school degree. What else am I going to go do? Right? Racing is what I know. Racing is what I love. Um and then, like I said, you throw in the, the family element. Like, I, I got to provide for them. So this is what I know how to do. And I got people willing to, to continue to have my back and push me to be a better person, you know, today than I was yesterday. Yeah, I'm going to keep this going. And it's because of those people that were staying here tonight. Okay, Daniel. Well, congratulations. Well-deserved. And uh, enjoy the offseason with the championship. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I mean, have a good offseason.